we are now putting forward a new historical Jesus on Marxian, catastrophic, and revolutionary lines. All right, before we get started, a word from our sponsor, Fathom the Good. They help kids and adults resist radical ideas with timeless truth. Their courses teach good philosophy to children and adults. These are the best ideas underlying Western civilization, including the American founding. They provide the knowledge families and communities need to navigate a radical world. Go to fathomthegood.com. That's fathomthegood.com and find out more. Here we go. All right, welcome to Quick Show. My name is Greg Matson, and I am your host. In this episode, we are covering letter 23 of C.S. Lewis's Screw Tape Letters. This will be in addition to our Liberation Theology series. Now, C.S. Lewis put these letters out in the Guardian newspaper during wartime England in World War II. These letters are a one-way correspondence between Screw Tape, an authoritative demon, and Wormwood, right, the nephew of Screw Tape and a novice tempter. Screwtape is mentoring Wormwood on how to be a better devil and a better tempter. These, one of these letters, letter 23, was published in The Guardian on October 3rd, eight, uh, 1941, as the historical Jesus. The title is meant as an ambiguity due to its numerous interpretations, right? We can make a historical Jesus whoever we really want him to be. It also is meant to use Christianity against itself. And this is the point where we are coming into now with the church, with Christianity as a whole, including the church. You will no doubt be shocked by the language, the words that C.S. Lewis puts in the mouth of screw tape here, such as social justice and Marxian. Though this has been happening for over 100 years, the letter remains prophetic for our day. Now remember that in the letter, the patient here is the Christian man that Wormwood, the nephew, is assigned to tempt. And the enemy in the letter is God. One more thing. Because this is coming from the demon's perspective, the devil's perspective, right? Bad is good and good is bad. Now, as I go through this, I'm going to step out of the letter here and there and offer just a few words and a little bit of commentary. I present to you C.S. Lewis's letter 23 from the Screw Tape Letters. My dear Wormwood, through this girl and her disgusting family, the patient is now getting to know more Christians every day, and very intelligent Christians too. For a long time, it will be quite impossible to remove spirituality from his life. Very well, then, we must corrupt it. No doubt you have often practiced transforming yourself into an angel of light as a parade ground exercise. Now is the time to do it in the face of the enemy. The world and the flesh have failed us. Now, stepping out of the letter here, I find this is very interesting because this is where we were in my generation. It was mostly the good old-fashioned uh, sins of sex, drugs, and rock and roll, right? And I often think today, wow, if we could just go back to those times of those normal sins. Now where we have issues where what is a woman, what is a man, and the family, and, and uh, identities falling apart here, we're in a completely different place. Screw tape goes on. He says, a third power remains besides the world and the flesh. And success of this third kind is the most glorious of all. A spoiled saint, a Pharisee, an inquisitor, or a magician makes better sport in hell than a mere common tyrant or debauchee. Looking round your patient's new friends, I find that the best point of attack would be the borderline between theology and politics. Several of his new friends are very much alive to the social implications of their religion. That, in itself, is a bad thing, a bad thing. But good can be made out of it. 
You will find that a good many Christian political writers think that Christianity began going wrong and departing from the doctrine of its founder at a very early stage. Well, actually, most Protestants and Latter-day Saints do believe that. Now, this idea must be used by us to encourage, once again, the conception of a historical Jesus to be found by clearing away later accretions and perversions, and then to be contrasted with the whole Christian tradition. In the last generation, we promoted the construction of such a historical Jesus on liberal and humanitarian lines. We are now putting forward a new historical Jesus on Marxian, catastrophic, and revolutionary lines. The advantages of these constructions, which we intend to change every 30 years or so, are manifold. In the first place, they all tend to direct men's devotion to something which does not exist, for each historical Jesus is unhistorical. The documents say what they say and cannot be added to. Each new historical Jesus, therefore, has to be got out of them by suppression at one point and exaggeration at another. Again, stepping out of the letter here, this is what liberation theology does. This is what critical theory, a critical theory view of the Bible and Scripture does. It's going to focus on the oppression of the Egyptians and the Romans and the shackles of political oppressors and not on yourself and your own sins and the faith that you need to grow, to learn, and to lean on the atoning sacrifice of Jesus Christ. Screwtape says, and by that sort of guessing, going with a focus here and a focus there, brilliant is the adjective we teach humans to apply to it, on which no one would risk 10 shillings in ordinary life, but which is enough to produce a crop of new Napoleons, new Shakespeare's, and new Swift's in every publisher's autumn list. In the second place, all such constructions place the importance of their historical Jesus in some peculiar theory he is supposed to have promulgated, like social justice. He has to be a great man in the modern sense of the word, one standing at the terminus of some centrifugal and unbalanced line of thought, a crank vending a panacea. We thus distract men's minds from who he is and what he did. We first make him solely a teacher and then conceal the very substantial agreement between his teachings and those of all other great moral teachers. For humans must not be allowed to notice that all great moralists are sent by the enemy, not to inform men, but to remind them to restate the primeval moral platitudes against our continual concealment of them. Notice how we suppress in our education system today those great moralists, and we give rise to, well, to others. We make the sophists, he raises up a Socrates to answer them. Our third aim is, by these constructions, to destroy the devotional life for the real presence of the enemy, otherwise experienced by men in prayer and sacrament, we substitute a merely probable, remote, shadowy, and uncouth figure, one who spoke a strange language and died a long time ago. Such an object cannot, in fact, be worshipped. Instead of the creator adored by its creature, you soon have merely a leader acclaimed by a partisan, and finally a distinguished character approved by a judicious historian. And fourthly, besides being unhistorical in the Jesus it depicts, religion of this kind is false to history in another sense. No nation and few individuals are really brought into the enemy's camp by the historical study of the biography of Jesus simply as biography. And this is where we get into academia, putting forward these historical Jesuses. 
Indeed, materials for a full biography have been withheld from men. The earliest converts were converted by a single historical fact, the resurrection, and a single theological doctrine, the redemption, operating on a sense of sin, which they already had, and sin not against some new fancy dress law produced as a novelty by a great man, but against the old platitudinous universal moral law which they had been taught by their nurses and mothers. The Gospels come later and were written not to make Christians, but to edify Christians already made. The historical Jesus, then, however dangerous he may seem to be to us, The historical Jesus, then, however dangerous he may seem to be to us at some particular point, is always to be encouraged. About the general connection between Christianity and politics, our position is more delicate. Certainly, we do not want men to allow their Christianity to flow over into their political life. For the establishment of anything like a really just society would be a major disaster. On the other hand, we do want, and want very much, to make men treat Christianity as a means, preferably, of course, as a means to their own advancement, but, failing that, as a means to anything, even to social justice. The thing to do, and this is the key to this whole letter here, the thing to do is to get a man at first to value social justice as a thing which the enemy demands, God, and then work him onto the stage at which he values Christianity because it produces social justice. Does that sound familiar? Using Christianity as a means... To produce social justice. For the enemy will not be used as a convenience. Men or nations who think they can revive the faith in order to make a good society might just as well think they can use the stairs of heaven as a shortcut to the nearest chemist's shop. Only today I have found a passage in a Christian writer where he recommends his own version of Christianity on the ground that only such a faith can outlast the death of old cultures and the birth of new civilizations. You see the little rift? Believe this, not because it's true, but for some other reason. That's the game. Your affectionate uncle, Screwtape. So you can see here in the mind of C.S. Lewis that one form of the historical Jesus that is used is to change him into a liberator, someone who is going to produce social justice. And again, what does that do? It creates the problem that God is supposed to help you with. It creates the problem being out there, right? The problem is with the political oppressors, not within yourself. Create social justice by bringing down the oppressors, And do not focus on yourself and your own repentance and your own relationship with God and with faith in the atoning sacrifice of Jesus Christ. That's the game. If I can put a fist up in the air going after the oppressors, I don't have to take personal responsibility for myself. I can deflect that responsibility and put the problem out there and not on myself. That will destroy your relationship with the atoning sacrifice and with God. This stuff does not go away. And my guess is, using different words, this has come around over and over again like a virus that is adapting to its host. And now we find ourselves with this virus that is very deadly to our society, to our families, and to each of us individually. Make sure that you go back and watch or listen to the other series that we have in this playlist of Liberation Theology. Thanks for listening.